Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 42 of Nutanix Weekly. I just hit the go button on Gyra. Uh, like, hey, we're just chit-chatting. I was like, are you ready? Ready. Good. Boom. Here we go. Uh, and we were just kind of chatting about the fact that uh, I, I, people struggle with the concept of what we're doing here. We're just taking really good blog content and talking about it. It's not hard. Um, and we're not geniuses. We just uh, we just know there's stuff that needs to be covered, and we give people a different path to get to it. Gyra Cox, how's it going? I think I learned a long time ago that, uh, you know, when you reinvent the wheel, you just get less done in the day. And yeah. I don't make particularly, you know, unique wheels. <laughs> right. So, yeah, for sure. Uh, uh, it's a good format of, of let's just help, help uh, give airtime to some already good content. Yeah. People put tons of effort into putting this stuff together. Let's just talk about their stuff. So on that note, uh, let's see, Harsha, how do you pronounce that uh, name? I don't know. Um, Harsha K. Yeah, I've never said it before. <laughs> yeah. On uh, January 21st of 2022, wrote a little article, Modern Infrastructure for Better Digital Learning Experience. I think what they're talking about there is uh, putting some Citrix workloads on some very capable Nutanix software-enabled workloads. Jaira, is that, is that what this blog is going to be about? Totally, right? About sort of, um, you know, both K-12 and higher ed right? Why, why Nutanix? Why Citrix on Nutanix? Uh, and, you know, why is that good for you? Yeah. So I, I live in a world of faster and even number two here simpler, but I wouldn't expect a number one here to be enhanced security. What, what, why is that one number one on this list? Are they, yeah, I mean, it's one, two, and three. It's prioritized. Why number one? Yeah. That one kind of jumped out to me too, right? I think if, if we are thinking about, um, <clears throat> networking for like a, a an EUC environment, right? Whether that's virtual desktops, one-to-one, -one, one to many. Um, that we know that networking is important, right? And Citrix brings some very key components to that, like NetScaler, of course, chief among them. But I, I think it's really the conversations I've been I've been a part of. All the brain power goes into making the connectivity to desktops work. Can users get to the internet? Can users get to desktops from their endpoints and devices? And not as much thought is given to, are we actually making this a secure environment? Like not even requiring, and it get, the article goes, goes into some zero trust yeah. elements of this. You know, what if one user shouldn't have to trust another user in the, in the VDI farm, in the EUC farm right. to be also a good citizen, right? Uh, and not a nosy neighbor. Um, and, and with stuff like, you know, Nutanix Flow, that's not required, right? Like I can say, hey, all of y'all can get to the apps you need to get the get, get to the internet, get connectivity to your your thin clients, you know, your your iGels, your all kinds of stuff like that. Annie knows more about this than I do. But once you're there, like your desktops can't see each other, right? Um, I, I personally, in this day and age, if I, you know, tomorrow flipped over and became just an internal admin, I would trust my EUC environment less than almost any segment of the network, right? I probably here's, trust my DMZ the, here's more the secret. than- we're, we're taking users in their desktops and putting them in the data center. Yeah, I probably <laughs> trust that that subnet less than like the DMZ itself, like yeah. with, with wide open access on some ports to the, to the internet, that's almost gonna be better behaved than like, oh, you know, the place where malware starts and spreads. Right. Yeah, it could be, and, and I, think about this visual from time to time. It's like when you have a, a subway system and you, you allow, I'm talking about physical transportation subway system, and you allow, you know, users and people to start coming in and out of it. They come and go in all kinds of places and all kinds of bad stuff happens and it gets dirty and grungy. You want to keep it as locked down as tight as you can, as long as you can. And this enables you to do it so that, uh, you know, that uh, east west traffic that is looking to do bad stuff can't do it. Right. Like if, if you could solve that, right. You could take the subway system and say, as you put your token in, assuming people still use tokens for subways. I don't know. I live in the suburbs, but if you, if you put your token into the subway and you, then we require you to step into like an Intel clean room, like bunny suit. Yeah. And then you can ride the subway. The subway would stay clean forever. It'd be great, but that's not scalable. Right. We just killed the whole usefulness of using the subway. Well, think about that exact scenario. People are currently more often than not getting in their individual car that they pay for and maintain themselves and drive somewhere when we should probably, you know, there'd be a lot more efficient to, to live in urban design places or at least places with transportation that could get you from your house in the country to the city. And then from there, go wherever you need to. We, we, the fact that we also drive around in cars or we also have individual laptops that we carry around is 
is kind of crazy. Well, that's almost uh, right. So, so to put to to bring my analogy full circle, it's as if like putting your token in the into the turnstile magically just transports you into that clean room suit, right? There's no added efficient added uh, overhead or delays to efficiency of like having to get into it. We can just offer that same protection without without impact to the end user. Your analogy, they're fantastic. Or you know, subway buses versus cars, right? That's almost like a a, a powerful like uh, one to one versus one to many, right? Server based computing uh, analogy in some ways, right? Like, do you really need your own running instance of the OS to be effective at your job? You know, yeah. Maybe you do, maybe not, but worth worth uh, investigating. Well, and you brought up clean room, right? So okay, I, you can have your own endpoint. It's maybe it's Linux, maybe it's Google, maybe it's Windows, whatever it is. That thing doesn't get anywhere near the data. It can just view the data. And by the way, the data it's viewing and the apps it's viewing are, uh, they're going to be, you know, in a clean room and we're going to see where they're coming and going. And if something starts to look specific, suspicious, suspicious, we're going to stop it all right now. Yeah. Well, then, you know, I, and, you know, this is a, a partnership, right? Between what, you know, um, CVAD does itself, what the, like a WAF would do or the, the web, the NetScaler are, are part of that, right? With Flow you know, kind of the unsung hero of the capability there is what if I don't even know what my users need to get to or what the traffic should look like? Well, the fact that I can use flow in monitor mode and let it tell me what all the flows are and what's talking to what uh, and over what ports so that I can learn what what's at least going on, uh, find some low hanging fruit outliers that I definitely want to block and then take the rest of the flows and make them into a policy very, very easy, right? It's not like step one, start with a blank piece of paper and write down every port and source and destination, um, you know, and then eventually, you know, two years from now, we have a, we have a policy built. It's much, much faster than that. Yeah. Sounds like flow is a secure smart flow. Is that a, I can't tell if that's, I can't tell if that's a joke. No, it is. It, like, okay. uh, I think, uh, I think Nutanix needs to think about even making that name. I, I love oh. the name flow, uh, but flow almost, well, I guess flow's right. Flow's right. I'll give I you just, full credit for it if we adopt it. Secure smart flow. Smart flow. I don't know. Some tells me that's probably out there somewhere. All right. Uh, number two gets really into what uh, a lot of people think of first and foremost. Actually, number two is probably number two. What maybe most people think about when they talk about uh, desktop virtualization on top of Nutanix hyperconverged software on commodity hardware, uh, fast hardware. Uh, and that is simplified operations from a systems perspective. Totally right. So that <clears throat> the ability to, you know, let the humans on the team have a broader effect, right? Manage a wider field of assets because they're all more efficient, right? They're all more simplified from an operational standpoint. That gives you more time in your day, lets you lets your team get to more advanced and worthwhile projects time-wise um, yeah. as they're planning out their, their weeks and their sprints. Um, so simplicity, of course, at every level of the stack even in from like the Nutanix and Citrix integration, right? You go into Prism, you say connect to Citrix cloud and you're done, right? You're ready to deploy desktops. And uh, and we actually have, yeah, the article here links to that uh, later on. Uh, YouTube video we have around Citrix uh, deploying 2000 desktops to a cluster on AWS in under two hours, right? So super rapid time to value there. Right. I've seen and done, um, you know, traditional Nutanix in the data center, a update on a thousand desktops in under 15 minutes. Yeah. I had wow. to patch one app, right? I have one app, an easy patch. I use machine creation service and the efficiency of the Nutanix file system under that. And, you know, it, it happened. And the next user who logged in got the update and everybody after that got the update. I mean, here's a, here's a super easy one to tee up for you, Andy. Do, do you think a, a, a higher ed environment with like uh, students uh, logging in? all day, all day long might need like frequent, frequent updates to like everything under the sun. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you've got yeah. those that hopefully they've got a, a method of updating the applications in chunks. Yeah. You know, the guys at uh, Indiana university they just used to do three apps at a time, either three new apps or three updates at a time. And they would resell their image up and yeah, but it was nonstop. They have a whole team just patching that stuff. And like, yeah, totally. I, I think so. Right. I, I guess to, to, make explicit what I was making implicit in my question, right? If I was running EUC for a business, that's one thing, right? Like my accounting teams, my marketing teams, my IT admin desktops, yeah. I understand those users and use cases and, and end users and um, and they work for the same company, right? We're all on the same team. If it was a student and, and higher ed facility relationship, right? 
boy, I, I wouldn't want to run an EEOC environment that I would log on to as a, as a student. I would be poking at all the fences all day long, right? Like Raptors just sort of like keep testing, like, can I get through here? Can I get through there? You know, um, yeah, patching, probably patching and, and endpoint security, crazy important. Yeah, crazy important and ever evolving nonstop. And you got those pesky students in this case, which some of them might just like breaking stuff on for fun. <laughs> I, I will neither confirm nor deny. That sounds terrible. Who would do that? Yeah, I, I'll tell you a quick story. I, uh, I, I live now close to where I grew up. I'm on the board of directors at my condo association. And I made a joke to the president a couple months ago about when I was 22, I jumped over the fence and went skinny dipping in the, in the pool. I thought it was gonna be funny. I mean, she was seriously upset at me. I was like, that was 25 years ago. <laughs> I, guess, I, I guess my point there is uh, we're going to be mischievous at that age and you know, maybe it comes back around someday. It's, it's, uh, it's how I got my first job in, in IT was at my university getting onto the dorm network was at the time, basically a, a kind of a glorified Mac address whitelist. Yeah. And so the, you know, every fall, right. The wait to get your Mac address entered was like very, very long. Right. So I like, I, I went, I, I filled out the form, didn't hear back, went to go check on it and like, Hey, just curious what's going on here. Is this like a Mac whitelist? And they're like, Oh, you know what a MAC address is? Hey, do you want a job? Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. Right. Cause I'll get on the network faster. Yeah. The physical layer and the OSI model and what a lot of people younger than us don't even know exists is um, yeah. There's, there's still a lot of value in some knowing how that stuff works. Okay, uh, number three, faster deployments and consistent experience. This is the bread and butter of why hyperconverge and specifically Nutanix makes sense, whether it's in a um, hyperscaler or in the data center of your partner, aka Zintegra, uh, or in your own data center. What can we say about this that hadn't already been said and proven? Just underlining right the importance of, of performance and and user satisfaction, right? Like we're deploying those desktops for a reason. They're not there for their own self-serving goals. Like they're there to help, you know, an employee accomplish their tasks, help a student accomplish their learning or testing or lab environments, um, you know, and, and it just couldn't be more clear, be more correlated that quality of experience is tied to productivity and satisfaction, right? People are gonna to wanna to learn more, they will learn faster, get their stuff done faster, whether well, that's a positive experience, right? So, um, yeah, I think, we're, I think we're past EUC as a workload being, um, you know, when you first put it on the whiteboard as a project, like, oh, we'll just tuck it away on some whatever is available compute and storage, like it's gotta be a first class citizen because um, end user experience matters. And, and the benefit that, we, that Nutanix brings to that uh, conversation is that predictability, right? Like my thousandth desktop performs like my first desktop. There's no degradation as I scale out because, you know, you never know when you get that call and all of a sudden you have to double the size of the environment. Um, you just never know, right? Uh, the on-demandness, uh, the scalability matters more than ever. Yeah. Yeah. The closest thing I can equate this to, which is starting to be something that falls on deaf ears is going from a spinning hard drive in your PC to a SSD drive and and how things just seem magically so much better. Um, you know, there's, there's a generation that will have never had a spinning hard drive in their computer or in their tablet. Um, and they have no idea what I'm talking about, but that's what it feels like the first time you go to a, a Nutanix hyperconverged platform for your, for your desktop virtualization workload. It's, it's like whatever was wrong before is still wrong, but it's so much faster, you don't care. Yeah, I mean, I mean that's just... That's just uh technology right like if a report if a report five years ago took a week to compile and then now it takes an hour to compile if performance degrades to an hour and a half right 50 percent longer it's like well no one cares that five years ago it took a week to do they care that now it, it takes an hour and a half right go fix it yep. so the, 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 need for, the, need for, report, the need for performance uh, is never ending ran a report in salesforce this morning came back with twenty thousand records or something and it took i don't know 10 seconds or so to come back uh, and I'm sure this stuff's running on, you know, high-speed hyperconverged stuff back in some data center somewhere. And I'm sitting there waiting, waiting, and I'm just, oh, I can't believe that took 10 seconds. <laughs> um, where that might have taken a week, um, five, 10 years ago to get that I, right. I, uh, I, I certainly, of course, um, 
whatever I, I am I am however old I am I'm, I'm younger than some and older than others um but there was I remember one time my rep and I were driving out I don't know two hours or so uh for a sales call meeting and um I wake up you know get in the car start driving I'm navigating the whole way the uh, I get a strange call from this unknown number as I'm driving so I put a, answer it put it on speakerphone it's my rep he's at a gas station and his cell phone's dead that day. And uh, he's like, hey, I need directions on how to get here. Like, what's, which exit off the highway is it? And then, you know, turn left, turn right. And then it's the third parking lot on the left or whatever. And I'm like, is this what sales was like in the 90s? Like, I, I don't like it. You know, <laughs> like, I've never, I've never done this job without a smartphone, without navigation in my hand, my calendar in my hand. I've never called into the home office to get my missed calls and my notes or find out what's next or look up something in a, in a Rolodex. It's uh it's a whole different world, you know. It, it is, but occasionally you have to go back to it, and you have to know how it how it worked. You know, how do you get? How do you pull out a map? I, I don't. If, if you read if road the, signs, <laughs> um, I, I have no idea if the singularity occurs tomorrow. If or not, not singularity. If the EMP goes off tomorrow, like I I, I won't be be any good in sales. <laughs> I'll go I'll go figure out how to how to plant wheat. Okay, that's not that's <laughs> not what I expect you to say, but okay. <laughs> Plant. Really, it's not surprising at all that to, to you that I would be completely useless to that uh, modern technology. <laughs> uh, I think you'd be more valuable than you think. However, I think there's certainly a generation of our peers in our generation that really couldn't do it anymore. And there's a generation or two to come that uh, will have no clue that I go back to my uh, you know OSI model and understanding how the network protocols work. I don't know how you do networking without knowing how that works, but apparently you don't have to anymore. And maybe things like flow or, you know, the enablers to make that obfuscated from the need to know. I mean, there definitely is a whole, a whole shift coming, right. Which I'm sure will be several future podcast episodes around, um, you know, once you've learned, yeah, layers one through seven, and you could, you could walk through like a campus level network diagram and understand subnets and routing and all that jazz applying that foundational learning to cloud networking changes so many things, right? Like stretching layer two and availability and gateways um, uh, and cloud networking models, right? And VPCs, you know, it just, it, it takes all that up to the very next level. You, it almost, it, it kind of does and does not add like layers like eight, nine, and 10 to that model. It, it does. And I don't think you have to understand the, some of the sub layers anymore. I mean, I haven't done enough cloud networking to tell you that you don't have to have that background. I, I think it it depends, right? We're, we're probably living that experiment now, right? People are are absolutely jumping in to that part of the deep end without, like you said, you know, covering the you know the foundations. Yeah, I mean, you know, who knows, right? Like that's what kind of what cloud networking um, offers, right? Is I just I click this button and now I have a new subnet and it just works, right? And I don't have to. Uh, route it or trunk it or, you know, create a VLAN to go with it. I just say, I want this and I just get it. Yep. Just get it. It just, just happens. Yep. Yep. Well, Jaira, I appreciate you. I can't remember what I did there. Um, appreciate you jumping on and covering this topic. Um, sorry, Harvey couldn't make it today, but uh, we've got something that you and he wanted to cover that he said, don't cover without me. So that'll leave people with a little suspense. Stand by. It's going to be good. I think uh, to highlight something on Harvey's behalf is Harvey's uh, uh, running our state local education business going forward, as well as still being one of the leaders in the company from a technologist perspective, which that's how his Integra rolls, right? We're, we're not a bunch of business guys that started a company and went out and found a bunch of engineers to, to make our dream come true. We're engineers that are trying to make our business dreams come true. Um, but uh, Harvey's really busy with, with helping to grow that business and adding value. And that's kind of the, that's the Zintegra way. So uh, with that, I appreciate you joining and uh, we'll do it again in a week. Yeah, man. Talk to you next week. Thanks.